Hey everyone, I wanted to make a separate video to explain the relationship between frequency intensity with the stopping voltage as well as the photo current observed in the photoelectric effect. In this video, I want to explain in a bit more detail the relationship between photo current and the intensity of light that's used to produce the photoelectric effect. So by way of recap, Einstein's quantum model was developed to explain the observations made by Lennard when he produced the photoelectric effect by shining light of different frequencies as well as intensity on a metal surface. In the quantum model, Einstein explains that light energy is quantized, meaning that it's divided into discrete packets of energy, which can be called photons, and the energy of a photon can be calculated by timesing Planck's constant and the frequency of the photon or of the light. So in the photoelectric effect, when light is illuminated on the metal surface, Einstein said you can perceive that the light's energy is divided into these discrete packets called photons. And each time the photon is incident on the metal surface, it can transfer its energy to the electron that's in the metal. Most importantly, Einstein emphasized that this energy transfer can only occur between one photon to one electron. So a single photon can only transfer its energy to one electron, and one electron can only receive energy from one photon. And this energy transfer can only occur if the energy of the photon is greater than the work function of the metal. And the work function refers to the minimum amount of energy that's required to actually break the electron from the metal's intrinsic structure. If the energy transfer occurs, the remaining amount of energy of the photon after overcoming the work function is always transformed into the electron's kinetic energy. So Einstein said, if the energy transfer occurs, the photon will transfer all of its energy, so it wouldn't keep any energy to itself, and that remaining amount of energy after the work function is overcome is always transformed into the electron's kinetic energy. This leads to the important equation in the photoelectric effect, that is, the maximum kinetic energy of a photoelectron is equal to Hf, which is a photon's energy, minus the work function of the metal. In addition, Einstein's model also proposes that the intensity of light, which will be the focus of this video, is related to the number of photons. However, what I hope you will understand by the end of this video is that although the number of photons will dictate the intensity of light, having a constant intensity does not mean that the number of photons is unchanged. I want to demonstrate this concept by going through a simple scenario. Let's say I have green light of wavelength of 500 nanometers and intensity of 100 watts per meter squared and these photons will be incident on a 1 meter square area of a particular metal, and this metal has a work function of 3 times 10 to the power of minus 19 joules. So given the wavelength, we can obviously calculate the photon's energy by dividing Planck's constant and the speed of light by the wavelength. So Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. The speed of light is 3 times by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second, and we'll divide it by the wavelength in meters. This gives me a photon's energy of roughly 4.0 times 10 to minus 19 joules. Now, as you can see, the energy of the photon is higher than the work function, which means that this green light source will be able to liberate the electrons from this metal surface. Given the intensity, which is 100 watts per meter squared, we can also calculate how many photons are actually incident on the surface per second. Since the area is exactly one meter squared, I can then say the power is equal to the intensity of light times of the area, which will be equal to 100 times by 1. So it's 100 watts, or you could write this as joules per second. In every second, you can expect there to be a total of 100 joules of photons incident on the metal surface. Since we found the energy of one photon, as well as the total energy per second, we can then divide them to find the number of photons that's incident on the surface per second. So number of photons then equals to 100 joules per second divided by 4 times by 10 to the minus 19, which gives us 2.5 times 10 to the power of 20 photons every second. Now, let's look at a slightly different scenario. If I change the light source 
to a shorter wavelength of 400 nanometers, but I keep the intensity constant. And I'm using the same metal as well, one meter square area, and the work function is still the same. Now you might be thinking, if I keep the intensity here the same and only change the wavelength, wouldn't the number of photons also remain the same? Actually, that's not the case. Since the wavelength of the photons changed, we would expect the energy of each of the photons to also change. So we can calculate this by using the same equations as before, but now we divide it by 400 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. So this gives me an energy of 5.0 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And of course, given that this is a shorter wavelength than before, the photon will definitely have more energy than required to liberate the electrons as it is greater than the work function. The intensity remains as 100 joules per second per meter squared. So we can also set the power is the intensity times by the area. So that's still 100 joules per second. But for this blue photon, the number of photons will be equal to 100 joules per second divided by a slightly larger energy per photon. And this gives me 2.0 times 10 to the power 20 photons incident on the metal per second. Now you can see for the green photon, because each photon has a small amount of energy, there are more photons incident on the metal to provide the total intensity of 100 watts per meter squared. For the blue photon, because each photon has more energy, we need fewer number of photons to give us the same intensity as the green photons. So you can see by this comparison, even though the intensity of the two light sources are identical, because the energy of one photon has changed, that also changes the number of photons that will be incident on the metal surface. So what's the implication of this? Well, as we know, the energy transfer occurs between one photon and one electron. For the green light source, because we have more photons per second, we will also observe a greater photocurrent. Conversely, for the blue light source, because there are fewer photons per second, we will see a smaller photocurrent for this particular light source. This question was posted on our YouTube channel, and out of 59 people who attempted the question, only about two thirds of you have gotten a correct answer. Now that you've watched my explanation from this video, hopefully the answer will make sense. When the physicist changed the 500 nanometer light source, which was the green light source that we saw earlier, to a 400 meter nanometer light source, which was a blue light source that we saw, not only does the photon have more energy, which results in a greater kinetic energy for the photoelectron, so that's going to give you a higher stopping voltage to stop them from crossing the two metal electrodes. We also saw that from our calculation, because the energy of one photon has increased, even though the intensity of light is kept unchanged, this resulted in fewer number of photons, as fewer number of photons is required to give you the same amount of energy per second and per meter squared. This is the reason why by using a 400 nanometer light source, not only will you have a higher stopping voltage, but you will also have a smaller photocurrent because there are fewer electrons being ejected per second due to the presence of fewer photons incident on the metal per second. Hey everyone, if you found this video helpful, smash that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Want even more? Become a Patreon member for early access to videos, exclusive Discord discussions about questions on chemistry and physics, and live preparation sessions for your exams. Don't forget to head over to our website for topic tests and practice exams to further improve your understanding and learning.